if you don't follow yet on Instagram, Impact Worship, I need you to, do we have a slide? We have a slide. Look at that. Perfect. Scan that. Go follow it right now. This is, this is, there's not, there's not really anything on there yet, but there will be. It's going to have all the clips from the recording, all the video clips, all kinds of cool things on there. And so I want you to take out, don't just look at it and don't do what I say. Like, if you love our church, I want you to take your phone out and follow. You say, I don't have Instagram. What is the matter with you? Download Instagram. It's God's gram. And, uh, <laughs> and, and scan that and, and follow us today. We've, we've got some fun stuff coming uh, for that. But um, how many are ready for the word? You ready for God's word? I felt like that was a good 20% of you are ready for the word. This is, this, I, I want to make a, a proposition. I, I want to preach basically till Jesus comes today. And so, but, but if, if you're going to help me, if you're going to help me preach, if this is your first time, we just, we're a little different. We're crazy around here. But I, I like to preach together. Because I'm not like some dude on some holy, like, I, I'm right there with you. So if, if you're going to help me preach, I invite you to stay. But if not, you can leave right now, and I'll preach to, to whoever wants to stay. How many ready for the word of God today? Come on. I, I have learned something in my own life. And, and maybe you've learned this, is that. Many times, many times in life that God's most beautiful gifts, they come in ugly packages. I mean, look at yourselves, for example. I, I mean, seriously, like God's most beautiful gifts, sometimes they come in these ugly packages. Like you didn't know, you, you didn't realize all that pain that you went through was God unwrapping your purpose in life. You didn't realize that that addiction was the key to your anointing. You didn't realize that you couldn't see it, but that deception was the route to your destiny. You thought you were being overlooked, but God was just hiding you. He was protecting you. He was keeping you. Listen, you thought it was rejection, but I woke up this morning to tell you it was actually God's protection. God was keeping you and hiding you and saving you for something better. Now listen, it's interesting to me because the Bible says this. It says in Genesis 50 verse 20 that what the enemy meant for evil, God will take it and use it for good. How many believe that in your own life today? In other words, the very same weapon that the devil tried to use against you is the same weapon that you're going to use against the devil. It's the same weapon. He flips the script. I, I want to start by reading Romans 8, 28, and then I'm going to pray. But look at this with me. Romans 8, 28. How many have ever heard this verse before? And we know that in all things, somebody say all things. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Does anybody love God today, Impact Church? I don't know. I've told you this before, but everything's a competition to me. Everything. That's why my wife and I don't even play Uno, because she's very competitive too. And we'll end up in therapy over an Uno game. But everything is a competition. Everything. Everything's a competition. I don't know why. It's just that way in my head. And every time I preach, I've got this internal game going on. Who won, the 9 a.m. or the 11 a.m.? And I just want you to know right now, you're losing badly to the 9 a.m. So you can change that, and I'll let you know who wins by the end of the day. But it's a competition. Look at somebody and tell them we're going to win this one. Come on, tell somebody we're going to win this one. Father, thank you for a great day. We thank you for your words. Speak to us, change us, challenge us. God, love us. We pray this in Jesus' name. We all say Amen. Amen. Let's give Jesus another round of applause. Come on. Yeah. 
in the book of Samuel, somebody say Samuel. First Samuel, there is this prophet, and his name is Samuel. Isn't that creative? It's like, what should we name the book? I don't know. Travis. It's First Samuel. First Samuel chapter 16, there's a prophet. His name is Samuel, and Samuel's job is to find the new king of Israel. Saul was the king, and Samuel is going to find and anoint and appoint the new king of Israel. This would replace King Saul. And so Samuel goes to this guy named Jesse, who was David's father. Jesse went directly back in the bloodline to Abraham, and so he needed to find a king from this same bloodline. And he goes to Jesse, and he says, Jesse, bring me your sons so that I can anoint one of them as king. And so Jesse brings him seven sons, but he intentionally leaves out little David. And I love what this says in 1 Samuel 16, 11. Look at this verse with me. He says to Jesse, he says, are these all the sons you have? The Lord has not chosen any of these. And then Jesse says, well, they're still the youngest, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and the goats. So Samuel comes along, he's like, Jesse, let me see your sons. I need to pick one of them as king. Here's son number one. Nah, two, nah, three, nope, four, nope, five, nope, six, nope, seven, nope. Bro, you have any other sons that I can take a look at? I mean, I do. I have this one son, but he's young still. He's a shepherd boy. He's too young. He's not experienced. He could never be king. He's not ready for this. And listen, look at somebody and tell them this statement. Look at somebody right now. Look him in the eye. Look him in the eye and tell him you're the one. Tell him you're the one. You're the one. You're the one. Look at somebody you don't know and tell him you're the one. Come on. You're the one. You're the one. Listen to this. The Bible goes on to say, Jesse's like, it can't be David. He's not old enough. He's not good enough. He's not smart enough. He's not prepared enough. He's not educated enough. Everything that Jesse's thinking about his own son. Now look what it says in 1 Samuel 16, 7. You've heard this verse. God does not see as humans see. Humans look at the outward appearances, but the Lord looks into the heart. Samuel told Jesse, send somebody to get him, and we won't continue until he gets here. So Jesse sent for him. He had a healthy complexion, attractive eyes, a handsome appearance, much like Pastor Travis. And the Lord said, <laughs> it's not supposed to be funny, come on. And the Lord said, go ahead and anoint him. He's the one. Look at somebody and tell him again, you're the one. You're the one. You're the one. You're the one. He said, he's the one. He's the one. And Samuel took the flask of olive oil and he anointed David in the presence of his brothers. I woke up this morning in a really good mood. And I came to tell you that you might have been the world's last pick, but you are God's first pick. And the world might have looked you off, but God's eyes have always been on you. You might have been overlooked by man, but God has handpicked you. You are the one. You are the one. You're the one. In, in man's eyes, David's not the one. In man's eyes. But in God's eyes, he's the one. In man's eyes, you're just a kid. In God's eyes, no, you're a king. You're the one. You're the one. And I wanted to talk to you today, those that have felt overlooked and you have felt unseen in your life. God wants you to know today that you are the one. God sees you. He sees your hard work. He sees your selflessness as a wife, as a mama. He hears your dreams and your heartbeat and your passions. He sees your pain. He sees your tears. He sees your fears. He sees every trial and every struggle. God sees your heart. And so I want to dig in today for those who have ever felt overlooked and unseen. Because I've been dealing with this with friends and family of mine for the last two weeks. Man, nobody sees my efforts. 
Nobody sees my sacrifice. Nobody sees my abilities. Nobody recognizes my talents, my heart. Nobody can even see my anointing. And I have felt this way in my own life many times, overlooked. Like, God, hello, pick me, pick me, pick me, pick me, pick me. God, I feel like nobody is noticing the hard work. Nobody's noticing the sacrifice. Nobody noticed. God, I need you. I need you to recognize me. And listen, this is what I want to tell you today, and I said this a minute ago. But I've realized in my own life that when I have felt that way, that God wasn't overlooking me. He truly was keeping me hidden for the right place in the right time. And he's doing the same thing for you. You know, God has a better plan for your life than that relationship that didn't work out. God has a bigger opportunity for you than that opportunity that fell apart. You're bigger than that situation you came out of. You're bigger than that failure you came out of. You're bigger than that heartbreak you came out of. You're bigger than that depression you've been dealing with. You're bigger than that fear you've been battling. You're bigger than that little town or city you came out of. You're bigger than that family, and we all love family, sort of, that you came from. See, one day, and I really believe this, one day, you're going to be able to look back and say, thank God he was hiding me. Thank God he was hiding me. If you've ever felt like a misfit or an outsider or an outcast or inadequate or undervalued or overlooked, that's why I showed up today. It's to tell you that God is telling you, you are the one. You are the one. You are the one. David's David's own father overlooked him. Why is it that sometimes the people closest to us look us off the most? Why is it that the people sometimes closest to us, they can't see what we think we can see in us? God says, you're the one, you're the one, you're the one, you're the one. And listen, sometimes the closest people, yeah, they are the ones who overlook you the most, but they only see who they used to know. They don't see what God sees in you and what he knows about your future. They don't see what God sees in you. I want to give you three takeaways today. Three. This is it. Three takeaways. If you've ever felt overlooked or unseen, number one, never forget that God sees me. God sees me. Look at somebody and tell them God sees you. God sees you. God sees you. Man might be looking you off, but God sees you. God sees everything about you. That's good and bad. God sees your hard work. He sees your skill set. He sees your talents. He sees every effort. He sees every detail, every emotion. Some of you found yourself in your bedroom this last week crying, and nobody knows about it. God knows about it. God saw you. God saw the tears, and God saw the emotions. Listen, the world might not see you, but God sees you. The world might not see it in you, but God put it in you. God sees you. I want to read to you Psalm 139, the first eight verses says this, O Lord, you have examined my heart and you know everything about me. You know when I sit down. You know when I stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel, when I get rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say before I even say it, Lord. Verse 5, you go before me and you follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Somebody say amen for that. Verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. God sees you. There has never been a moment in your life that God's eyes were not on you. There has never been a moment just like God saw little David. His own father didn't see it in him, but God saw it in him. David to his daddy was just a kid, but to 
to God, he was a king. And he would be a king not only for Israel, but he would be a king in the very bloodline of Jesus Christ. Did you know that God can take you from the back to the front in the blink of an eye? That God can take you from the bottom to the top in the blink of an eye? I want to read you a scripture. It's one of my favorites in Deuteronomy 28, 13. It's God's promise for your life. We're going to read this out loud together. Ready? Here we go. If you listen to these commands, this would be your external voice. Ready? Here we go. If you listen to these commands, let's stop. Time out. You used to do this in school sports. Time out. If, somebody say if. If, if you listen. Because, because I'm about to give you what God's promise is for your life. But there is, there is a premise to the problem. If you listen, okay, there's more premise to this. Listen, if you listen to these commands, ready, here we go. Of the Lord your God that I am giving you today. And if you, time out. We can't get to the good stuff yet. Because some people think that, like, the goodness of God and the favor of God just falls on your life because, I, I mean, I'm God's child. He says, if you listen and if you, because, because a lot of times we, we listen, but we don't do what it says. And then we want God's blessing on our life. I heard it. I believe it. It's not that I don't believe it, God. I believe it. You know my heart. But I'm not doing it. Okay, let's continue. If you listen to these commands of the Lord I got, I'm giving you and carefully obey them. Let's read the rest together. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail, and you will always be on top and never at the bottom. How many know that's a promise of God right there? Hey, some of y'all can't get off the bottom, and you're like, man, why has my life always been like this? Man, every time I try to get, oh, I get kicked back down to the ground, and I don't understand because God's word says that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, but I feel weak, and I'm at the bottom. I've been at the bottom my whole life. Because you aren't hearing God's word and you're not doing God's word. L listen, I I'm going to step on some lot of toes. I know it. I want God to bless my finances. But I'll never give him 10% because I'm afraid and I fear what I won't have instead of what I might have. I know, I just messed up a lot of you. And he says, I want to read it again because he's saying, listen, if you, if you listen to these commands, the Bible, the word, if you listen to them and if you do them, it doesn't matter if you like them. <laughs> it doesn't matter if they feel good to you. There's a lot of things in the flesh that feel good. There's been some times I've wanted to kill some people. In the moment, that might have felt really good. Or at the very least, slap them upside the head. Not a good idea. Not a good idea. So he says, if you do this, I will make you the head. The head. Not the tail. And you will always be on top. And never at the bottom. Never at the bottom. Listen. God sees you, and he sees things in you that you don't even see in you. Do you remember the story of Gideon? Seven, seven, eight, nine, <laughs> ten. So Gideon's out in the wine press, the Bible says, threshing wheat. You know what his career was? Threshing wheat. He's out threshing. He's just doing his job. I'm out being a real estate agent for God. 
I'm being a doctor for a guy. I'm out being a teacher or a coach, a physician. For, he's just out doing his thing like he always does his thing. He's out threshing wheat in the wine press when an angel of God shows up. Would that not be like the dopest moment in your whole life? And this is what the angel says. He goes, Gideon. Gideon, mighty man of valor. Gideon, mighty warrior. Gideon's like, hey. You, you might have the wrong Gideon. There's another Gideon two blocks down. You got the wrong Gideon. No, I got the right Gideon. Gideon, God sent me to come see you and give you a message today. Gideon, mighty man of God, mighty warrior. Mr. Angel, I am not a warrior. I have never been in a fight. And he says, Gideon, God sent me to tell you that you're going to lead the Israelites in a battle to defeat the Midianites. I got to read this to you. I got to read this to you because this is where it gets so good. Gideon says, how can I rescue Israel? My family is the weakest family in all of Manasseh, and I am the least, the weakest in my entire family. So, We've got a problem, Mr. Angel. I think you got the wrong Gideon. No, I got the right Gideon. God sent me down here with Google Maps. I double checked it. It's the right Gideon. I'm at the right Gideon's house, and you're going to defeat. I've never been in a battle. It doesn't matter if you've ever been in a battle because God sees things in you that you can't see in you. God sees the victory in you before you even know there's a battle. Gideon, you're the right guy. I am, you got to understand, Lord, let's, let's modernize this. We're in Scottsdale, Arizona. It's kind of a big deal. There's people of prominence and power in this city and position as people of wealth. Have you not driven by Silverleaf, my God? If you're not driven down Lincoln and Paradise Valley, this city's a big deal. But my family, we actually don't even really live here. We just go to church here. We live in Yuma, the armpit of Arizona. <laughs> actually, more like the butt crack of Arizona. No, that's Tucson. My bad. Tucson <laughs> is definitely... The booty crack. There's one good thing that came out of Tucson, my wife. Yep. And she went to U of A, and then she got saved. And so, <laughs> like, okay, let me just say this, Mr. Angel. Manasseh is not known for, like, anything. And then there's my family that's the least of all the families in this town. And then there's not only my family that's the least of all the families in this town. Then there's me, who's like the least of my family. You know that God specializes in using the least likely over and over and over and over. You don't know my situation. I came from drug addiction. You're the right guy. You don't know my situation. I've been through three divorces. You're the right woman. You don't know my situation. I've been through fear, and I've been through addiction, and I've been through depression, and I've been through all kinds of health. You're the right guy. You're the right girl. God uses the least likely. He uses the least likely. And I love this story because not only did God see it in Gideon, 
But God sees it in you, too. He sees it in you. You know that God knows exactly when and where he needs to open that door in your life. God knows exactly the right person he needs to bring along at the right time for your life. Listen, I've learned this. If it's not God, I don't want it. Because there have been some things in my life that I wanted so bad. And I even thought they were God. That I know for a fact, hindsight, if God would have let that happen, I would have destroyed my own life. Let's go. Number two. When you feel overlooked and unseen. This is a big one. This is a real big one. Keep my heart right. Keep my heart right. We looked at last Sunday. Proverbs 4.23, and I want to I look at it again for a second, because Solomon says, above all else, guard your what? Heart. For everything you do flows from your what? Heart, right? Last Sunday, I read it in a different translation. It says, be careful how you think, because your life is shaped by your thoughts, right? So be careful how you think, your life shaped by your thoughts. Be careful. Above all else, guard your heart because where your heart goes, your life goes. Keep your heart right because it can be tempting when I feel overlooked and unseen and undervalued and underappreciated to let my heart get cluttered with the trash of this world. It can be tempting, man. They don't see me. They don't see the value in me. And I can become bitter, resentful, jealous, envious, prideful, discouraged. Keep your heart right. This is what God said in his word. 1 Samuel 16, but God does not see as humans see. He looks at the heart. Humans look at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. God knows the truth about you. This is so important because the human heart, it can get so easily twisted and damaged and deceived and confused and even convinced, manipulated, hurt, broken, offended, defensive. Man, nobody sees me. Nobody appreciates me. Nobody values me. Nobody sees my efforts, my sacrifice, my love, my hard work. And if you're not careful, you can get spiritual heart disease. Spiritual heart disease is when you become sick with discouragement and anger and bitterness and jealousy and envy and hate And that offense in your heart can become the devil's greatest weapon that he uses against you. The Bible has so much to say about the heart. I want to read you a few of these verses in Jeremiah 17, 9. Look what he says. He says, the heart is what? Deceitful. Deceitful. And it's deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? You know, he's not talking about... He's talking about your heart. He's not like, that dude over there's heart is deceitful. He's talking about your heart, my heart. The heart is deceitful and it is beyond cure. Has your own heart ever deceived you? Raise your hand. It's deceived. You thought that was a really good idea. And five years later, you look back and go, what in the hell was I thinking? Anybody ever live that? Because the heart is deceitful. I've done it in every, I've done it with people I've hired. (laughs) I'm like, that's a really good idea. Four months later, that was a really bad idea. Relationships, that seems like a great, nope, that's a really bad idea. I've done it with like investments, hello? That's a really good investment, that's a really bad investment. Right? The human heart is deceitful. It is beyond Cure. This is what Proverbs 3 5 says. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and what? Lean not on your own 
understanding. Why? Because your own understanding is limited and it is deceiving. Right? Psalm 51, David. David, by the way, David, the Bible says, was a man after God's own heart. David became king and was anointed and appointed king, not because of his talent, but because of his heart. But he wasn't perfect. He not only had an affair, gets a woman pregnant that's not his wife, and then he's in charge of the military, he decides to put her husband on the front line, so he dies. I mean, that's messed up. Raise your hand if that's messed up. How many have ever killed somebody? Raise your hand. It's messed up. How many have ever, how many of you are currently actively having an affair? Raise your hand. No hands. Liars. I told you there's other churches. What I love about David is there's this prayer in Psalm 51. Verse 10, and David said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right or a steadfast spirit within me. See, why is David a heart, a man after God's own heart? David had a repentive heart. If you're going to be repentive, you have to look yourself in the mirror and be honest. You got to be truthful about yourself because we live in a self-righteous day. So I got to look at myself for who I am. That's not enjoyable. And have a repentant heart. The Bible says, and David said, a broken spirit and a contrite heart you will not despise. I love this prayer. God create in me a pure heart, a clean heart. Jesus talked a lot about the heart himself. He said, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. What does he mean? Where you spend your money, that's what your heart is on. That's what he said. I didn't say it. He said it. I'm just repeating what he said. Like if I could see your bank account statement for the last 12 months, I could tell you what you love the most. Wonder if God would be number one. Just like Starbucks, 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 Starbucks. Mine would be Mexican food, Mexican food, Mexican food. Shoes, shoes. <laughs> so Jesus says, where your treasure is, your heart. Jesus said, we looked at this last week, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. So your mouth is tied to your mind. He said, a good man brings the good things out of his heart, but an evil man brings the evil things out of his heart. I, I love this chapter in Matthew 15 because Jesus ain't playing around no more and it's just kind of like my kind of preaching. He goes to the religious leaders, Pharisees. Look what he says in, in, in chapter 15 of Matthew verse 7 and 8. He says, you hypocrites. Would you do me a favor and look at somebody and tell them you're a hypocrite? Would you just do that for me? <laughs> Didn't that feel good? You're a hypocrite. People say, I don't want to go to church. It's full of hypocrites. What's one more? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, what's one more? Come on in. It's not like we're trying to be. I can't wait to wake up and be a hypocrite today. Like, jeez. But he looks at the religious leaders and he goes, you hypocrites. Listen, imagine if Jesus was saying this directly to you. He said, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In other words, you act like you're a child of God, but you aren't a child of God. You look like it from the outside. But I look at the heart, and you aren't on the inside. You hypocrites. I know today hypocrite to us is like, man, that's such a dirty, gross, like hardcore word. And it is, but it comes from the Greek word. Hypocrite comes from the Greek word 
hypocrite. Isn't that fascinating? <laughs> With a K, hypocrite. And, 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 and so hypocrite, hypocrite was a common word during Jesus' time for actor. So we're going to go to the theater and we're going to watch our favorite hypocrites. Today we say actor. We're going to go watch a movie, our favorite actor. means hip, He's saying, you're just acting. You're just acting. You're not actually the real deal. You're a false advertisement. Next week's sermon, I got it right there. I, I want to keep going. Listen to this. Because Jesus is talking about the importance of the heart. In verse 19, he still continues and he goes, for from the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, and all the other sexual immorality, theft, lying, slander. Comes from where? The heart. He said, these are what defile you. Okay, if you read this in context, it's like the religious leaders are all after him. Like, why are you doing miracles on the Sabbath, bro? Why are you putting stuff in your body that the Old Testament said not to put in your body? Hey, you're in church. Take that cowboy hat off. You're in church. Take that A's hat off. What is that? A's? Oakland A's? Oakland A's? Take that Oakland A's hat off. You're in church, my God, the sanctuary, the house of the living God. <laughs> right? I wear a hat to preach a lot. I like hats. I said it last week. Listen, God is more concerned with your heart than the hat on top of your head. It, it's like Jesus came along and he's like, it's not about what goes into your body. It's about what's coming out of your body. And you're all a bunch of hypocrites. Don't you love it? Me too. I love it. This is important because he, he's talking about the heart and how we can come down with heart disease. He's saying the same thing that Solomon said in Proverbs, that where your heart goes, your life goes. See, some people have a mouth problem. They have a mouth problem. What that really means is they have a heart problem. Man, I can't clean up my mouth. I, I use profanity and I lie and then I lie about my lies and I lie about my lies and my lies. I belittle people. You degrade people. You gossip about people. You slander. Of, listen, you talk to somebody else about my life when they have nothing to do with my life. They're not a part of the answer. They're not a part of the solution. They're not even a part of the problem. Gossip is when I talk about you to you and you have nothing to do with them. Why do I gossip? Have you ever thought about it? Because it gives me an artificial, superficial sense of feel good. To tear them down to make me feel better. But it's phony. It's not real. And gossip kills. It kills relationships. It could kill somebody's business practice. It could kill somebody's reputation. Slander kills. Jesus is addressing the heart. He's addressing the heart. See, people who gossip and slander, there's something missing in their heart. They're hurting in their own lives. They're either hurt or jealous or angry or envious. They have this need to feel important by sharing this information because it artificially and temporarily makes me feel better about myself when I tear you down. Some of you have an angry heart, but you know what that really is? Is it's an unforgiving heart. And so Jesus talks about the heart. You know what's great about what God says about the heart? In Ezekiel 26, 36, listen to this. He says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. 
See, God doesn't want to just clean up your heart. God wants to give you a brand new heart. He wants to give you a brand new start, a brand new mindset, a brand new life, a brand new chance at life. I will give you a new heart. Acts chapter 13, verse 22, after removing Saul. By the way, you got to be careful with the anointing that God has placed on your life. Because as Job found out, the Lord gives and the Lord God takes away. After Saul, it didn't say after Saul resigned. After Saul had been removed. The most powerful man in the world at that moment had been removed. Because of his heart. Because of his heart. So we have to protect what God has given us with reverence and respect and holiness. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. Let's move on, number three. You guys good? Number three. If you feel overlooked and unseen, keep doing what you're doing. For God. Somebody say, for God. For God. For God. God. Colossians 3.23, you've probably heard this verse. It says, whatever you do. I like that. Whatever. Whatever you do. I like your hats, by the way. Those are, I'm thinking I might wear one next week. Maybe not as womanly, but I might go for it. Montel Jordan last week was trying to get me to wear one of his, and I'm like, I don't know, man, if that'll work on me, but I might try it. He says, whatever. (laughs) Sorry. Whatever you do. I love the word whatever. Because he's saying, whatever you do in your life. Let's continue on. Work at it with all your what? Heart as working for the Lord and not human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. So if whatever you do is all-encompassing, first of all, It changes my perspective about life. Because if I'm going to be a daddy, I'm going to be a daddy like I'm doing it for God. If I'm going to be a husband, I'm going to be a husband like I'm doing it for God. If I'm going to be a great employee, I'm going to be an employee like I'm doing it for God. Whatever, Whatever you do, do it like you're doing it for God. This is good for you that parents and you have children. You want to take out the trash, baby boy? Take that trash out like you're doing it for Jesus. Because this is what I've discovered in 2022 is that we live in a lazy, corner-cutting generation. How little can I get away with? We need to teach them now. You do everything like you're doing it for God. And if I'm a husband... To Natalie, like I'm doing it for God, she reaps the benefit. If I'm a father like I'm fathering for God, my children reap the benefit. Keep doing even behind the scenes. I've not been, un- I've not been seen. I've been unnoticed. I feel overlooked. Keep doing what you're doing for God. This is what David was doing. He was, in the, he was a shepherd boy. David wasn't going, hey, can I be king? Hey, can I be king? Hey, can I be king? He he was just doing what he was called to do, and he was faithful with it. And you remember the verse that Jesus said, if you're faithful in the little things, you will be what? Given more. And be careful because everybody wants more. But Jesus also said, to whom much is given, much is required. So... 
David is, li- li- listen, I want to read. He's a shepherd boy, and he's doing what he was supposed to be doing when he got the call up. I'm just being faithful with what God has given me right now. I'm not doing it for human affirmation. I, I don't need somebody to notice. I don't need somebody to see me. I don't need somebody to praise me. I don't need somebody to affirm me because I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing it for God. This is what Paul said in Galatians 1.10. He said, obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. Man, that's a great philosophy for life. If people pleasing were my goal, then I would not be a Christ servant. <laughs> if people pleasing is what you're trying to do, you'll be a servant of people and not God. I'm glad you guys like Impact Church, most of you, and I'm glad you love it. I'm glad you're a part of it. I always say our Impact family. You're our Impact family. You're our Impact family, right? Love our worship. I think, you know, you love the sermons. I think most of the time you love the sermons. But, but listen, I just want to say this. But I don't really care if you do or don't. Genuinely. I genuinely don't care what you think about what I'm preaching. Because what I'm trying to do is preach the written word of God that he's called me to preach. Whether somebody likes it or not. And somebody say, man, everybody's got an opinion. Everybody's got an opinion. But if it's not in God's book, those opinions don't matter. Everybody's got an emotional thought about culture. and says, If it's not in God's book, I don't care about it. It doesn't matter. We have to keep our eyes on the prize. And who are we actually living for? Who are we actually trying to please? I want to stand in front of God one day. Not you. I want to stand in front of God one day and him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I don't care about the Google reviews. I don't care about the Google reviews. Listen. Some of y'all hit me up, try to talk politics. I don't care about politics. I literally do not care. I am not here to be political. I'm here to be biblical. Okay? I'm here to just preach a word. I don't, he's like, hey, this is my point for all of us. How much would this one small concept change our entire world if we focused on God pleasing and not man pleasing? Pleasing our good God. Man, we, we, we got all these confinements. Amelia, you're right. You get in worship and... Can you imagine if you were literally physically standing in front of the physical living God? You think you'd be standing there with a Krispy Kreme donut and a Butterfinger coffee? Well, she's kind of crazy. Nah. You would be broken, bawling, on your knees, running around the church building in freedom and celebration. But we're not going to do that because, well, somebody's here with me that I work in my business with them. Man, focus on God. What does God want to do in your life? What does God want to do in your life? You don't have to be dignified. We don't care. Does anybody care what somebody looks like while they're worshiping God? We don't care. We just don't care. Y'all might care, but we don't care. And we shouldn't care. We should be loving enough to cut the strings off people's lives. We should be loving enough to say, I'm not putting you in a box do whatever you want for Jesus. I ain't putting you in a box, man. However you feel like your heart wants to worship God, worship God. He said, like, I'm an introvert. Great, sit there. I, I'm not asking everybody to be crazy. I'm asking the crazy people, if you want to be crazy, be crazy. 
I'm asking the quiet people, if you want to be quiet, be quiet. We are not going to put each other in the box. The world does that. God's word doesn't do that. He liberates us. If you start reading through the scriptures and seeing all the weird things that happened after somebody received a miracle, or how about before somebody received a miracle? Some of y'all want a miracle? This is my Krispy Kreme. Butterfinger coffee. Yeah, I hope God does a miracle. My life's falling apart. <laughs> I have preached way too long today already. There were, there were, there were, cr- <laughs> I really, I really got to finish. What time is it? 1237. 1237. It's like, okay. <laughs> Everybody that works for me, keep going. I'm just saying like. Dude was blind. Do you believe? I do believe. Jesus reaches down, takes some dirt, spits in it, and shoves it in the dude's eye sockets. And he still, he still wasn't healed. <laughs> he said, go jump in the pool. <laughs> Weird stuff, man. Like. We want, we want God to do the supernatural, but we're just going to stay confound in the natural. I'm not saying go jump off a building or something and be like, God, save me. <laughs> you said in Psalm 91, your angels will rescue me. Woo! Like, you're going to die. I mean, I need my worship team. Come on, I, I got I to gotta, I gotta close. But I, but I do want to close with a couple thoughts because I think it's actually sad that we live in a world that glorifies and values what we see and not what we don't see. The world makes us think that what's seen is significant, but it's what's unseen that's significant. Like, Man, you're, you're, a, you're a celebrity. Can I get your autograph? Can I get a picture? And then we post it on the gram, the God gram. We're like, look who I was with. And it makes us feel a little bit more significant than we are without it. We never go up to somebody who's like, dude, can I get an autograph from you? What's your name? Scott. Scott, can I get your autograph? And you're like, yeah, but why? I'm nobody. Because, bro, you have incredible character. And you have high integrity. And you love Jesus Christ. And that matters to me. <laughs> hey, could you imagine after church today, you're like, I got this dude's autograph. And everybody's like, who is that? Who is that? Who is that? Is he somebody? He must be somebody. You click on his followers and it's like he's got like 12 followers. That's nobody. No, he's somebody. <laughs> I said I was going to end. Because, because we glorify what we see and not what's seen. We glorify actors and actresses and athletes and celebrities and wealthy people. And listen, somebody could be morally and spiritually bankrupt, but if they got talent and they got money, then we celebrate them. We glorify the visible when the invisible is what's most valuable. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. See, listen, I want to tell you to keep working diligently, but also keep building your character and allowing God to build your character in the dark. Because, listen, I, I, I'm going to just tell you from experience, that spotlight, it will either highlight you or expose you. Father, we thank you for this great day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you that, Lord, your word can be hard to hear, but it can also be a great, a great life-changing experience if we truly hear it and walk it out. Listen, I know there's somebody here that you said, man, I'm not even a Christian yet. I I came with my family member. I came with a friend. I, I, 
I don't even know really why I'm here. I'm here to tell you why you're here. God wants a relationship with you. God sent his one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for you to pay the price for your sins, past, present, and future. He wants a relationship with you. Romans 10, it says that if you believe in your heart, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, then you are saved. And if you're here today and you don't have a relationship with God, today you say, man, you're speaking to me, PT. I want to give my life to Christ. And I want you just to do that right now. Pray in your own way, in your own mouth, from your own heart. Jesus, today I give you my life. Come on, say that out loud. Jesus, today I give you my life. Say this out loud. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Today, I want to live for you. And before we go, I, I just, I really feel that there's somebody in here that you have felt so overlooked and you have felt so unseen and undervalued and underappreciated that it has spiraled you into a depression. And that depression, I want you to know, that is everything that the devil could throw at you. And it still didn't work, because you're here today. And no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus today. And God is going to flip the script. And he wants you to know that he sees you. He sees you. You matter. You're valuable. Get ready for the doors that God is going to blow open in your life. Get ready for the opportunities that God is going to show you. Get ready for the doors that you're about to walk through.